Hi, everyone. I'm um, I'm seeing the participation or the participants filling up here, which is wonderful. That means everything is working. So welcome to everyone who's coming into this session. Um, I'm delighted to have you here. Um, if if I haven't met you before, or um, if this is your first time seeing me, who I am, I'm Nicole Johnson, and I'm the research director for the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association. And what we do is we conduct surveys uh, related to digital learning, and we take a look at the national level. So in this year, in 2021, we resumed our uh, national survey of online and digital learning, which I'll be talking about in this. And I'll be specifically talking about the Ontario results for our national survey. So um, with our survey, we survey all of Canada and we'll be releasing a na uh, national report in the new year, but we'll also be releasing an Ontario report sooner. And this presentation is specifically focused on Ontario. Um, as we get started too, uh, I wanna let you know that I'm moderating uh, my chat here um, as I go. And because I'm gonna cover a lot of material in this next hour, um, I'm, I'm happy as questions can come up and as uh, subjects come up in the chat, I'm gonna be monitoring it throughout. So if there's something that's uh, really relevant um, to the slide that I'm currently on, um, please pop in your question as you go and I may just pause the presentation to answer questions or to respond to comments in the chat as we go. So I'm hoping that this will be quite an interactive hour that we have together and I'll be presenting a lot of uh, really interesting data from this past year um, and we'll have a good conversation about it and I'm, I'm excited to get started here. So the first thing I want to do before I start is I want to uh, acknowledge the land that I'm on. Um, I'm presenting today from my home, which is on the traditional ancestral unceded shared territory of uh, the uh, Sumas First Nation and the Matsqui First Nation. Um, these two First Nations are part of the Stolo Nation and the Stolo people have lived in the Fraser Valley of British Columbia for 10,000 years. Um, and it's particularly important this week to be acknowledging the land that I'm on and the colonial impacts of the land, because as many of you have heard in the news, um, although where I, I am safe, where I am in my home, it is my community that is currently experiencing significant flooding. And uh, part of that is because of um, colonial actions about 100 years ago. So um, I'm very mindful of that, of, of this land, of the, I'm learning a lot this week about the Indigenous knowledge that's related to um, my community. And I'm just seeking to better understand the impact of, of uh, British Columbia and Canada's colonial past and present, and really how that is impacting my community um, as we go forward. So with that, I am going to give you an overview of what I'm going to cover today. I am going to be covering um, some data that we asked related to faculty and student challenges, expected trends, student preferences and expectations, faculty attitudes and support, and tracking the growth of online and hybrid learning going forward as we continue in this pandemic and start to look forward to what, um, you know, I know, I know lots of us don't like the term new normal, um, but I can't think of a better term for that, um, but what this new normal is going to be. Uh, one thing to mention as I go through this data, uh, when we talk about faculty and student challenges or faculty attitudes or student preferences, these are institutional perceptions. So with our national survey, we survey institutions. Uh, it goes out to a key contact at the institution who then um, typically in the past has passed, sometimes is passing the survey around to multiple people, but this doesn't necessarily reflect um, what faculty or students might say for themselves. This is what the uh, administrators and uh, key um, key staff at the institution, um, what they're hearing from faculty and from students and what they're observing in their role. 
So a bit of background. So we did conduct our national survey uh, in spring of 2021. Uh, this was after a one year hiatus. We did not conduct our usual national survey in 2020. Uh, due to the pandemic, we did a couple pulse surveys instead at that time. Um, we have been conducting the national survey as an organization. Uh, we have been doing that since 2017. And which is great because we're starting to, we, we have really interesting data from prior to the pandemic, what things looked like. And now we're starting to, as we're resuming um, our national level uh, survey efforts, we're starting to see what the impacts are. And so uh, within Ontario, uh, during our uh, gather, data gathering period between April and July, we had 29 responding institutions in Ontario, uh, which was uh, 95 institutions Canada-wide. Um, the, we released a report on definitions in July 2021, and we validated this report um, throughout the summer and the fall to get a lot of feedback on it because we we understand that um, definitions are evolving. Definitions, um, each institution uh, has certain ways that they've been defining things, and our efforts are to try to find common ground and a way to to um, have common ways of communicating what we are doing at multiple different institutions and across institutions. So I'm going to start by talking about the challenges. And so again, these are the institutional perspectives of challenges relating to faculty and students. And this is in, um, again, at the time of spring 2021. And at that time, we it's not surprising that we see student stress and mental health and faculty stress and mental health top of the list for institutions. Uh, we also see online assessment practices as being um, a challenge, which is consistent with what we've been hearing um, on the ground and in our qualitative work. Um, and then faculty, about just over half of institutions uh, mentioned that a faculty attitudes towards online learning um, was a challenge and, uh, you know, a significant minority that, um, you know, student access to technologies and student engagement with the community addressing inequities and so forth. Um, what's also interesting that we is not just what we see at the top of the list, but what we see near the bottom of the list that um, you know, from the institutional perspective, uh, that faculty engagement isn't, you know, with students isn't so much of a challenge right now. Um, and that faculty access to technologies isn't so much of a challenge. Um, that's an, that's an interesting um, to give a bit of context as well. I've done other research projects over the past 12 months that have surveyed faculty um, has surveyed uh, students in both the Canada and uh, US context. And um, I, I, we're curious to see going forward and some of our 2022 research efforts are gonna begin to look at uh, differing perspectives within institutions, because um, I wonder that if faculty had answered this, if they would have ranked, you know, if, if they would have, if we would see different findings on this chart. So these, uh, what's near the bottom of the list gives us some idea of what we need to unpack and look at going forward. Um, expected trends in 2021. We found it uh, very interesting that we see partnerships with third parties, uh, third party companies um, being very likely. And this is what, um, when asked in the spring, these are what institutions were expecting to be happening right about now, actually, you know, as we wrap up the, the fall 2021 semester and look forward to the winter semester. Um, this is back in the spring, what was anticipated at roughly this time. Um, we see that, you know, some institutions, about a quarter of institutions see that it maybe somewhat likely to have more partnerships with other institutions or more partnerships with the private sector. But ultimately, the, in terms of partnerships, um, again, nearly half of institutions said that it was very likely 
with an additional, you know, roughly a third saying that it was somewhat likely to have that. As we go into offerings, what institutions expected in the, when asked in the spring um, to be their offering uh, in the 2022 winter semester, um, we see that a real trend toward hybrid learning, and that would be reflected in the first uh, bar on the chart, which is more courses and programs being offered in a partially online setting, um, with you know half just over half of institutions saying that it's very likely and additionally another 41% saying somewhat likely. And um, that seems very consistent with what we've observed uh, happening in the fall. We have asked institutions, we did send out a follow-up survey just a few weeks ago just to compare because when we did this survey in spring when it went out, this was pre-Delta variant. Um, and a lot has changed um, as we're still in an evolving pandemic since these questions were asked. So when we released the, um, both the Ontario report and the national report uh, coming out in you know, the coming weeks and months, um, we'll be able to offer some insight as well as to whether there were changes in um, what was expected in the spring and then what is actually happening or expected at this time as we're well into the fall semester. Um, we see uh, the trend, uh, the expectation towards more hybrid than um, more online. So, um, whereas you know, fifty-five percent of responding institutions felt you know saw that being very likely of having more partially online courses uh, by the winter semester, um, only thirty-four percent felt that there'd be more courses offered in a fully online format. With that said, you know you know, only 34% of the, you know, it, that, that's still a third of institutions that are expecting to have more fully online courses. So we are seeing, um, and then of course, when we look at the somewhat likely bar, we see that it's a significant number. Um, what this tells us overall is there's, it's very likely that we're going to see an ongoing and persistent trend towards more online learning, towards more digital learning, towards more technology used in the classroom. And, um, you know, we see greater use of digital teaching materials, um, more alternative credential offerings. Um, again, the one thing that was seen as less likely would be uh, the full return to in-person learning. And again, those, those numbers might be lower if we ask that now in the context of um, you know, the variants of concern that are coming out. We also asked about uh, support. So trends towards support for faculty. Um, we saw that the most likely uh, trend would be the further professional development for faculty um, with again, we're seeing almost 70% of institutions saying that it's very likely that there'd be further professional development for faculty. And this is professional development related to digital learning. And then an additional 25% saying it's somewhat likely. So um, it makes sense with having a greater trends towards expectations for greater hybrid learning, especially, but also more online learning that there would need to be further professional development for faculty so that they are very comfortable teaching um, in multimodal settings. Um, we've got, we see that there's gonna be um, at many institutions, uh, a likelihood of upgrades to the technology infrastructure. Uh, also seeing increased support for the use of OER. Um, that makes sense with a lot of access issues that we've heard over the past year with uh, students, especially with the move to online and wanting to make uh, higher education more accessible, more equitable, um, and that many, you know, the OER are one way to do that. And it's, it's um, very uh, incorporating that into a digital setting makes a lot of sense. Um, we see uh, less 
Uh, less of a trend towards additional resources in instructional design for online course development. And again, that's an area that could use further research and that we'll be digging into a bit more likely in 2022. Um, because we need to find out what this means. Does this mean then that um, this might be that there's more, like we saw before, those third party partnerships? Perhaps it's a uh, greater hiring of instructional designers as we, you know, as we know has happened at many institutions. So there's a lot to look at in terms of what's happening with these trends. Now, as we go forward into student preferences, we see that again, and I remind that this is the uh, institutional perspective on student preferences, not the, you know, from students themselves. Um, but we asked about whether they'd be more likely to prefer online courses uh, in the, you know, in this academic year that we're currently in than prior to the pandemic. And so we see for most cases this um, that there's somewhat agreement that there's that seems to be the most consistent thing that it's somewhat agreed that they like to see more on um, prefer online courses. We see that more so um, when we look at, you know, when we look at international and domestic students, we see that is interesting uh, that it's being the same in terms of strongly agree, but quite a discrepancy in terms of those that somewhat agree. So I think there's, you know, a lot of wiggle room. There doesn't seem to be a lot that's in any of these categories that strongly agree, you know, that they're going to see student preferences for, um, online more so than prior to but there is this sort of somewhat agree this ambiguity that get uh, you know there what we also see in this chart too that we don't at the same point we don't see a lot of strong disagreement um in some cases we don't see any strong disagreement and you know the two areas where we see the somewhat disagreement would be with the graduate you know 25 percent somewhat disagreeing would be with the graduate students and uh, international students. So this this tells us that there is um, some investigating to be done in terms of student preferences, but also, you know, by these different categories and how they're broken down. In terms of student expectations, uh, you know, we do see that institutions are anticipating that students are going to expect greater use of um, technology, greater um, flexibility. And that's consistent with some of the qualitative research that I've done over the past couple of years. But, um, you know, there's very little disagreement with this and very little um, neutral uh, feelings on this. Overwhelmingly, um, institutions are in agreement that to some extent there's going to be greater use of digital re educational resources. Uh, you know, students are going to expect more flexibility in their courses. Students are expecting more hybrid offerings, which again, that mix of online and in person instruction. Uh, one thing that we've heard from both faculty and students alike in terms of the other research I have done that's consistent with this is this um, idea of more options for connecting with professors virtually. Zoom office hours seem to be working really well for a lot of people. It avoids both faculty and students alike needing to drive into campus to, um, you know, have a conversation and we're seeing, um, we're seeing a lot of options for video conferencing to replace what before might have had to be face to face. And then again, also this um, idea that technology, even in in person learning, um, that there's a trend toward more technology use being incorporated into fully in person learning um, going forward. When we look at faculty attitudes and institution perceptions of faculty attitudes, um, we see that there's uh, positive trends, you know, they're agreeing that faculty are more likely to access support for using technologies in their courses, they're more likely to be using digital teaching materials, and this makes a lot of sense in the fact that, um, you know, very few faculty now 
uh, do not have experience teaching in some sort of online context. Throughout the pandemic, most faculty in Canada did get, um, you know, whether, whether they loved it or hated it or fell somewhere in between, they did gain experience using uh, digital materials. And some of the research we did in 2020 showed that faculty certainly expected to change um, their teaching practices, uh, even if they went back to in-person, just based on what they learned in being forced to try new things during the pandemic. Um, we see a lot of interest uh, faculty, uh, the perception that there is going to be more faculty interest as well in teaching um, courses that are hybrid, that partially uh, online learning. And okay, and I've got, I'm just checking the chat here too as we go. Um, yeah, so, so Laura, I'd ask, I missed if these student survey results are based on student data or if these are all the opinions of administrators. These are all the opinions of administrators. So it would be very interesting to do a student survey and ask these same questions and to see what the discrepancy would be between student and administrator perspectives. Um, and of course, uh, what's interesting though, we, we, we see again, you know, this perception that, you know, about 30% of faculty would be more interested in teaching hybrid learning, so that partially in person, partially online, but then only 11%. Uh, so uh, this, this, what seems to be a very prominent theme throughout um, the data is a, a greater interest, a greater expectation toward hybrid learning than um, fully online, yet still some increase in fully online as well. Um, with the challenges we saw before that there, one of the challenges was with online assessments, it makes sense here that um, we see a lower number of institutions expecting faculty to be more likely to use online student um, assessments. Um, what's interesting here too is with the OER, you know, whereas we see that sort of an expected trend at the institutional level, we we see sort of a that it there's less strong agreement here when um, institutions are asked whether faculty would be more likely to use OER. So again, that's something that um, needs further investigation as well as we go forward. Uh, for faculty support. We asked uh, institutions to what extent do they agree with these statements about support and resources for faculty at their institution. Um, so institutions uh, agreed very strongly that they provide effective training for faculty to use different features within the learning management system at their institution. Um, that there's, you know, about roughly two thirds uh, strongly agreed that they provided, you know, effective professional development for faculty who teach with technology, regardless of delivery mode, so that whether they teach with technology in an in-person setting or a fully online setting, but that there's professional development in place. Um, again, about 60% saying that they provide, uh, you know, effective training for faculty on alternative assessment techniques using digital technologies. Um, what we are seeing, though, is a lower agreement around providing funding and resources for faculty to use innovative technologies in their courses. Um, and again, this fits in with the OER as well. You know, only 18 percent are uh, agreeing strongly that they provide effective training to faculty on how to find and use um, OER. Um, although with those bottom two, there is, you know, a significant amount of somewhat agreement too. So we found these, um, these charts to be really, really interesting and insightful in terms of what types of professional development might be needed um, going forward, especially as we see um, an emergence of newer technologies of multimodal teaching and so forth. 
Now I'm going to jump into the conversation of definitions and I'm I'm going to I'm going to talk about this for a while because this is an important one as it's as um you know the pandemic's hit and now you know almost everyone has experience in one way or another with online teaching or learning um we want to come back to some of the previous work that we have done at CDLRA, which was um, started in 2017 in terms of tracking online course enrollments. And as we progressed and as we went through that uh, over the years, we were starting to notice um, inconsistencies, both, um, you know, within institutions, and this is, you know, across Canada, uh, both within institutions and also across institutions um, from year to year, making it very, very hard to provide um, reliable data, um, you know, and consistent for changes over time. And, you know, with the pandemic, it has become more important and more pressing to figure out how to effectively track the growth of online learning and hybrid learning in Canada. So what we did, you know, in the past, we put forth definitions and asked whether institutions agree with them, or don't agree, and tried to get a sense of what was going on. Um, but before, uh, you know, attempting to track enrollments again and going back to that, we needed to find a way to figure out how to do this consistently and to overcome some of the issues with inconsistency that we were finding. So we asked institutions whether or not they had a single institutional definition of online learning, remote learning, distance learning, and hybrid learning. And so we see that, you know, a good amount of institutions, uh, about, you know, just under 75%, just under three quarters, have a single institutional definition for online learning. When we go down to hybrid learning, that drops and it's just over half that have that. Uh, again, consistent definitions for remote learning and distance learning, it's about 50-50 with remote and then quite low for distance learning. And um, although the institutions might have these single definitions, um, what one institution defines as online learning might actually be very different from what another institution defines as online learning. And the same thing, especially with hybrid learning. Um, so even if an institution has a definition, the definitions might vary significantly from institution to institution. Uh, so what we did is we put forth a report um, called Evolving Definitions in Digital Learning, um, a National Framework for Categorizing Commonly Used Terms. Whoops. Um, and we've got, um, there's a link there and I will put that, um, I want to keep it on the slide if people are wanting to take note, but I will put that um, in the chat or I've got my contact information and I can send this report to you. What we've done throughout the summer is I presented this report and the framework that I'll be presenting to you in a moment to multiple groups um, across the country to get their feedback in terms of these definitions and whether this framework could prove useful for finding a way for a third party organization such as CDLRA to track um, online and hybrid learning going forward. So I'm going to switch to this framework and we call it the modes of learning spectrum. And it's a way to define online learning that encompasses the differences that institutions might have. So it doesn't necessarily require institutions to change or modify what they're doing at their own institution, but it allows someone like us to come in from an external perspective and sort the different definitions from in, uh, institutions into three distinct buckets, which would be in-person, hybrid, and online. And what we've done, and I, mean, I know that other institutions might, you know, um, you know, you might have different ways of defining these at your own institution, um, but this is meant to sort of provide a bird's eye view. Um, and yeah, and I'm seeing again a comment in here um, in the chat, which is really important actually from Laura saying, you know, a good institution 
a good definition from an institution, you know, interpreted in different ways by faculty at that institution. So um, yes, I agree as well. Faculty input on that will be interesting. And um, yeah, we've got Aldo in there too, you know, is the term hybrid uh, problematic that it conflates the concept of blended and online. Yes. So, and I'll talk about that in a second because we, hybrid was one of the most challenging terms that we've had to deal with. Uh, some institutions consider blended and hybrid to be synonymous. Um, some institutions consider it to absolutely mean two totally different things. So the purpose of this is even to provide a simplistic framework, which again, allows for multiple things to fit in. So if you look at the, um, at the left-hand side where it has distance learning and in-person learning, so we, for the purposes of simplicity and for this framework, we consider distance learning to be cinema, synonymous with remote learning. So it means you're just, you're not on campus essentially. And we uh, consider in-person learning to be synonymous with face-to-face -face learning or on-campus learning. And then you'll see the dividing line between distance learning and in-person learning happens right in the center of hybrid learning. So what we've done with the spectrum is the two extremes of the spectrum are not often seen in these days. And this is to sort of, there's a lot of blurry lines between each of these categories in the spectrum. So for example, in-person learning, uh, at its, you know, the very extreme would be that it's in person, it, there's not technology, there's no digital resources. Um, and that's not necessarily what, you know, we, we don't see that so often anymore. Um, up the spectrum is what we see most when we see in-person technology supported learning. So that might mean that in-person learning, there's a, a learning management system that still, you know, houses some the syllabus um, or provides some content, but it's not the instruction itself doesn't take place through the learning management system. The instruction itself takes place in the classroom, but there is technology supporting the instruction to some extent. Um, when we look at the extreme on um, in distance learning, the other extreme of that spectrum is the offline distance learning, which again, we want to include because it does still exist with, you know, print resources being sent by ma uh, mail, but there's no online component. And of course, what we commonly see in distance learning is that it is online learning. And, you know, for the purposes of simplicity, we've defined that as all instruction and interaction is fully online, um, synchronous or asynchronous. And we'll get into the, the, the hybrid learning, the most contentious one, especially as it really starts to take off. So our goal in this was to keep it simple so that we could fit multiple definitions. So for us, we considered hybrid learning to be an umbrella term, and we do consider it to be synonymous with blended learning for the purposes of this framework. We say that I say that with the caveat that we fully recognize that some institutions that is not the case but we do see that um you know it falls under what our category that large umbrella that there is some sort of blend of online and in-person instruction and the online may be synchronous or asynchronous we would consider for the uh, you know for intents and purposes of this framework that hybrid learning might look like that there is, um, you know, theory being delivered online and um, labs being done in an in-person context. It might mean that there is mandatory to attend um, some classes, you know, that you must attend some parts of the course in an in-person setting, but then you also must do some parts of the course in an online setting. We also see high, uh, hybrid is encompassing and which I know a lot of people have, um, you know, what seems to be a lot of strong opinions coming out over what does it mean the term high flex learning. We would put that in the hybrid category um, because in terms of high flex, we would see that students having choice to either attend uh, 
they can flip back and forth. Uh, they're not required to do it all online. They're not required to do it all in person, but they're able to go um, to attend online when they choose and in person when they choose and both options are available to them. And it's, again, it, it, is, it is blurry and a bit ambiguous at this time. We would also see it falling under as hybrid learning, um, a course where you would have it mostly online, but then there is some sort of in-person, you know, one week intensive or a practicum component. And I just wanna jump into the chat here too, before I go um, into further. Yes, and I see, um, yeah, Greg has commented too. What about interpretation by students as well? Do they all know what these definitions mean? That is a very good point. Um, that's something in our research that we have done in the, when we were surveying students in the US, I was involved in a research study that did that. And we were asking them about, um, you know, preferences for, you know, hybrid online in-person learning. We did not use those terms at all in the survey. We just described what the learning would look like from their perspective. We didn't assume that they would know these terms. And I think that, that would be um, at this point um, is describing what it would be and where they need to be. Um, there's also, again, in the comments, yeah, having a choice is a critical distinction between hybrid and high flex. Um, yes and no, for the purposes, again, I think down the line, we need to sort out um, the hybrid high flex. The purpose of, of this for us is being able to track the growth of, you know, basically what's online and what's not, you know, what's in person and what's hybrid and actually taking it down to three buckets. When we try to look at it in more detail, because I understand that point of having, you know, I, I would say to that, you know, having a choice is a critical distinction between hybrid and high flex. The issue for us in terms of tracking enrollments is, some institutions would strongly agree with that statement and some institutions would strongly disagree with that statement. And when we're coming in from sort of that, you know, upper, <laughs> upper perspective, that bird's eye view, and we're needing to figure out, you know, what's going on and sorting things, we need to find a framework that actually uh, enables both, um, you know, allows us to track consistently, you know, even if, in, you know, institutions are at two, um, have two very polarizing opinions about how high flex and hybrid should look. So this is, this is something that's really fascinated me for the past year as I've, and even a bit longer as I've gone through this, and how do we create something when there are such, um, such, uh, you know, you know, varying definitions both, you know, amongst institutions and even in some cases within institutions on these terms. Um, it's been, it's actually, it's, it's been fascinating and it's been a real challenge. Um, we have presented, I have presented these definitions to groups such as institutional researchers. Um, I've presented it to uh, various um, uh, ministry organizations. I've presented it to different um, institutions uh, who are able to, you know, give opinions from either both an administrative perspective. And I think what we need to do too is again, see, you know, what faculty are doing with these definitions and even how students and how students are defining or describing the courses that they're taking. So with that said, um, we've got about 20 minutes left in here and I would love to um, answer any questions that you might have about, um, this research. Uh, this is very much the tip of the iceberg. It's been a fascinating year in terms of what we've discovered. And the Ontario report is going to have even more information and details and insights um, for you. But uh, I've also included my email uh, address here. I would love to hear from you and also publications. So um, yeah, I'm going to jump into the chat again. And yes, uh, you know, Peter said, uh, a single metric might be challenging as an organizing tool for modes of delivery. What about a matrix that includes both location and time of learning? Um, 
I think so. We've looked at that right now. There's right now we almost need to go, and this is this is my opinion on it, and others may disagree. I think we need to go simpler than more complex, J just at least until institutions themselves have. So many institutions don't even have a consistent definition between their institution. Um, I think when we talked, I, I should mention as well, I also talked to registrars and presented this to a group of registrars who, again, you know, how does how does this look with course codes in catalogs and stuff like that? So um, yeah, it's it's a challenge. Um, uh, Danae has said, yes, uh, Danae, yes, slides will be available for this. I have um, submitted the slides to um, the test organizers uh, and they would be, I believe it's going to be available somewhere, but um, please, if you can't find them, uh, please send me an email and I'm happy to email you this slide deck. That's no problem at all. Um, Greg, you've asked, uh, do I do this presentation for individual uh, individual institutions? Yeah, I'm glad to do it. I would actually, I would love to do that because the more the more feedback from different uh, from different groups, from people who have different roles in institutions, it's been really helpful in shaping and refining this framework uh, over the past six months or so. So that's great. Oh, and good. <laughs> Greg, Greg said in the chat where you can find the uh, the slides um, and to download. That's fantastic. Um, that's wonderful. Um, but yeah, I know I've presented a lot of uh, a lot of charts and a lot of data in this. You know, the past uh, forty minutes or so. Um, I can also answer. You know, I'm happy to answer any questions of this. Um, Oh, do I know if, yeah, the MC, uh, you use this, uh, I, we've been in conversation with them and I think that, I think right now with every organization that I've talked to, right now definitions are a really hot topic and uh, it's how to best implement and uh, how to find consistent language going forward, uh, going forward is an ongoing conversation. So. Um, I don't want to answer, you know, if a specific, you know, if a specific organization is still using a term definitively, it did, yeah, <laughs> definitively, because, it, you know, what in the conversations I've had with different groups over the past year, it's very, uh, it's, it's evolving, even it's evolving within many groups, just as um, learning modalities have been evolving and emerging. Um, oh, great, good question, uh, Greg. Did um, some institutions have individual faculty complete the survey or one or two people filling it out on what they think faculty perceptions are? Uh, my understanding is the institutions had, it got passed around to the people who um, were filling it out based on what they think faculty perceptions are. Um, from my vantage point, I have been involved uh, in multiple studies other than this in the past year that have been specific to faculty. So I can say from my vantage point, what we've found um, is somewhat consistent in terms of what uh, faculty would say. There's other areas where I've heard um, other, you know, more detail in depth of remarks. So, um, and Krista, I'm just trying to keep up here with the chat. Uh, Krista, you uh, had asked, am I contributing to national or international studies, looking at the current challenges or trends? Uh, would be interested in those as well if I can point to sources. Uh, we, yes, um, I have been involved uh, in some studies with uh, Bayview Analytics. Uh, CDLRA has been part of those. Uh, if you go to, um, now I don't know if they're on our publications page. What I'll do is I will put, um, I'm going to put my personal um, publications page in here, just for my personal blog. If you go to there, uh, those are some of the studies that CDLRA has been involved with um, are listed on that page that are um, Canada and US based studies. Um, we've also I've been in conversations throughout the past year with my European colleagues and talking 
a lot of conversations about the data and trends over there and how they're comparative here, but I haven't done any uh, formal studies yet with that. Um, okay, and then from Danae, yeah, some institutions or instructors are saying that they're using HyFlex, but getting students to, yes, to choose at the start of the term when registering and then not allowing the switch throughout the term, right? Um, yes, we've heard of that too. And we're, you know, my perspective on that and the perspective that we're sort of moving towards is if you're, if it's at the section level, so hy hybrid happens, um, hybrid high flex happens at the level of the section. So if students have to choose whether they're gonna do a course entirely online, and they have to commit to that, then that's actually an online course. That's not high flex. If students have to commit to doing a section, you know, fully in person and they can't switch to doing it online, then that falls under the bucket of in person. That's also not hybrid or high flex. The, the key characteristic of high flex is that ability to switch back and forth. And I, I, you know, my heart goes out to the poor registrars in the community because that's, you know, my understanding is that's an absolute nightmare uh, from a registrar's perspective because they're they're having, you know, do they book a room? Do they not book a room? How many students are, you know, is it, are they, do they have to book a large room because most students will show up in person or, you know, are you going to get, you know, three students showing up in person and the rest online? And uh, that is where, you know, there's the there's the logistical side of all of these things, which still is being totally worked out and figured out as we move into this new space. Um, and yeah, students students can choose again. That seems to be sort of this theme, and so from that's worth, and that's something that we want to unpack as we go into hybrid learning, high flex learning much more and start investigating that side of digital learning in the next year of um, you know what do these things mean and in, in, in an international level this is an not just a Canadian level problem this you know what does high flex look like what does it mean this is something that institutions and organizations are grappling with um, you know everywhere because this is you know for many institutions a completely new concept um you know prior to the pandemic it really was very much um online or in person or if it was you know a blended or a hybrid mix it was distinctly we do this part online and we do this part in person and this concept of being able to live stream and have some people simultaneously online while some people are simultaneously in person or some sort of a, you know version of that is is so new and evolving um yes <laughs> and nonetheless it can be frustrating and you know what i i that's i think one of the goals of the spectrum too is at least to try to find common language to reduce frustration to engage in conversation and also so pe people can you know um understand what people are I mean sometimes two people can be talking about online learning or they can be talking about hybrid learning and the other assumes that the person they're communicating with um, shares the same definition as them. And we see that that isn't, our, our data points just that it isn't necessarily the case. So, you know, when I'm talking to someone and I'm saying, oh yes, and we're doing hybrid learning, um, what I think I'm communicating and what the per other person is receiving just might be completely different um, in terms of how we're defining that. Um, Yes, and, and then right there's the faculty. I'm, I'm looking at this too. Yeah, teachers too, who you know, they, teachers want to know what to expect when they show up to teach. They want to know how many you know students are going to be in the classroom. And um, like I said, this is a this is very very much in its emergent stages. And I think over the next couple of years, um, I think it's also going to be very interesting to see as we move out of the um, the pandemic um, context to see how the dust settles with all of this. Um, you know, what we have right now is we have what we project, what we have as likelihoods for 
you know, hybrid learning, for online learning, for in-person learning, and how we anticipate um, things might land going forward. But one of the things, and one of the reasons why we want to track these definitions too, is we that allows us to see how um, how these projections, um, whether they actually are coming to fruition, or whether we are seeing something different in terms of enrollment. You know, are we seeing that, you know, students are still choosing to go mostly in person, even with other alternatives available, when we look at it from not just a perception perspective, or uh, what they desire perspective, but from an actual enrollment perspective. And that's something that's really been critical to us at CDLR, uh, CDLRA in terms of tracking digital learning over time, is to get that data as to, you know, both in terms of what people perceive or anticipate will happen and then what is actually happening on the ground. So um, yeah, um, I, I don't see, I think I caught all the questions in the chat. Uh, ping me if, uh, please re put it back in the chat if, I've, if I have missed you. Um, And I'll, I'll leave it, I see people saying, you know, how do we send this recording to some friends? Um, I'll leave it to the eCampus Ontario folks to perhaps answer that. So um, yeah, that would be um, great. But yeah, I'm, I'm here and um, I think what I can also, you know, if we've got, I'm looking at the time here, we've got about 10 minutes left in this, uh, session where I'm available to you. What I can cover, because I know there was uh, that interest. Oh, yes, I've got Salima going. Can she come on camera? I'm going to say, yes, Salima, come on camera. I would love to chat with you. <laughs> That's perfect, since we've got 10 minutes. Let's, let's chat a bit. Amazing. So, Nicole, um, thank you so much for this presentation. It's been a lively chat, which is always exciting to see. Um, we have Nicole for eight more minutes. Um, so if anyone has anything else they'd like to add to the chat, please do. Um, but Nicole, I want to ask you a couple of questions. So uh, surveys are, these surveys were quantitative in data. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me more about how you're exploring some qualitative sides of uh, the space? Yes, absolutely. So what we do have is in the surveys themselves, there were some open ended options for open ended responses. So those are going to be in the Ontario report. So there's going to be much more, um, as mentioned before, this is very much this presentation is the tip of the iceberg, and we're going to have a lot more detail in there. And those open ended responses will provide a lot more nuance to some of the things that I've talked about and give a bit more insight from that. We also are in the process right now of, um, you know, so some people on here might have might have heard from me in their inboxes because we are asking leaders at teaching and learning um, centers at, or, or the equivalent at Ontario institutions. We've got a survey that has been sent out with some open-ended questions and we would love to get insights in terms of pedagogical practices that are happening, professional development that's upcoming. So we've gotten, we've received some great responses so far to that. We've also been able to, you know, base our questionnaire on some interviews with key uh, teaching and learning center uh, leaders. And I'm excited for that to be shared because that provides another, another angle um, as to and another vantage point to this you know, dynamic situation that we're in. Um, oh, good question from Peter here in the chat. As we mentioned, we're chatting, I'm, I'm looking at the chat as well. Um, about the OER responses, are you confident that respondents knew what OER said? Are there any validation checks? Good question. Uh, what we do is in our surveys, we do make sure that we provide a definition of what that is. But I think that that's a good point going forward. And that might be something just particularly with the patterns that we saw in the results around OER um, in 2022 to be asking about that a bit more. And again, just like we did with the definitions, when we asked institutions how they are defining these terms, we kind of unearthed a lot of things that we didn't, uh, we didn't realize or we didn't see. And I think asking, you know, 
what figuring out what that knowledge is that the knowledge base that exists and the common understanding that exists around OER is a is something that you know I think that's a very good point to see you know to not make the assumption that when we're saying OER that we that the people who we're communicating with um, have familiarity with that yet. Um, Oh, uh, Greg had asked, uh, was the data presented specific to Ontario or Canadian post-secondary institutions as a whole? Uh, Greg, yes, this is uh, specific to Ontario. However, in our national report, um, we will be presenting um, the nation as a whole. So there's going to be, in the coming weeks, an Ontario report and a national report. So both of those are coming out. Uh, do we have data specific to the prairies that I could share in a presentation? Um, if you could send me an email on that, because uh, we can take a look. Uh, we we very well may. There's different regions of Canada are different. One of the things we always do is we make sure we're not presenting data that would identify any specific institution. So we have to take a look at the the aggregate data that we have for a particular region. But uh, Greg, please send me an email because I would love to discuss that further. Yeah, uh, Salima, <laughs> we've got we've got four minutes left. <laughs> I kind of cut you off. I guess this is more of a a big open question to you, Nicole. What is your? Um, I like asking people for advice. What is your advice for institutions moving forward um, into post pandemic, the new normal, whatever, uh, as it relates to digital learning? And from what you've heard in the surveys, from what you're seeing across the nation. What's your like one piece of advice you want to give to folks? Uh, you know, I, I want to say my piece of advice is, uh, you know, remain um, open to new ideas and flexible. We're seeing this as an evolving space. Um, there's, you know, so much is emerging that sometimes it can be overwhelming. And so, you know, at the same time, well, you know, try new things. Um, don't don't be afraid to to fail. Um, I think too, as well in that uh, kindness towards faculty who are trying new things and who might um, might it might not land, right? They might try something innovative and having having a bit of um, grace and you know rewarding them for for at least being willing to attempt and try new things in terms of pedagogical practices and opportunities to course correct and figure it out and taking that uh, learning mindset and growth mindset. Um, because I would say from all the data I've seen in Canada and the US that things will change. Uh, things aren't going to necessarily go back to how they were pre pandemic. So this being open and flexible to new ways of teaching and learning. Um, you know, and, and just try new things. Let, let's see what's out there. Let's see what we can do and how we can figure out how to improve and teach in new ways using the technology that's becoming more and more available to us. That's such a good answer. Um, giving <laughs> with, with kindness. I think, I think as we emerge, um, I think kindness for me is so important. And I think uh, navigating uncertainty is such a such a challenge for so many folks and, and, and being mm -hmm. certain in uncertainty or trying to be certain in uncertainty. Um, thank you so much, Nicole. We are, we have two minutes left. I'm going to give a little bit of time for anyone to throw any burning last minute questions into the chat here. I'm not seeing anything come up. So, um, Nicole, on behalf of eCampus Ontario, thank you so much. This data is so wonderful and so insightful and it, it, it you know it's good data when it makes you ask more questions, right? Like that's always, that's how you know it's good research. Uh, and it just inspires all of us to ask more questions wherever we are. Um, so thank you so much for your time and, and for sharing this with us today. Um, to everyone in the chat, thank you for joining us. Uh, enjoy your last few test sessions and we'll see you very, very soon. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure. And thank you. All, you know, we, we just love working with eCampus Ontario and we just appreciate all your support. Um, it's been it's been wonderful and we're so glad to do this. Thanks everyone.